How's it going, everybody? My name is Parallax Abstraction, and welcome to a special episode of Retro Flashback. Um, just giving a little quick intro here for those people who may not be familiar. Uh, I'm recording this on July 3rd, 2014, which is a very, very sad uh, anniversary for those of us who follow video games, and in particular, the awesome video game website, GiantBomb.com. One of the founding members of that site and very, very beloved personality, Ryan Davis, uh, passed away a year ago today. And I'm not going to talk about it too much. If you know who Ryan Davis is, you already know what happened. If you don't, there are many easy ways to find out. But uh, Ryan was a, a really special guy. And though I never met him personally, he had a very profound impact on uh, on me and it, his his death, like many others, hit me pretty hard. Um, when we all found out a year ago, I actually wrote a blog post and did a Geek Bravado ramble on a very valuable lesson he taught me. So you can uh, you can go check that out if you want. But on the year of his, his passing, I was trying to think, what could I do in my limited capacities here to to honor him in some way. And I thought it would be cool to do a retro flashback on what he has called his favorite game of all time. And that game is Super Mario Brothers 3 for the Nintendo Entertainment System. I haven't covered a Mario game um, on this channel before. I actually haven't covered the ones before Mario 3. And I usually like to, to do that. I usually like to cover the oldest ones first because this is a show about showcasing gaming's history. But this is a special case. So... I thought this would be a, an interesting thing. Forgive me if my tone is potentially a little more somber during this episode. It is uh, it's a rough day for a lot of people out there. But Ryan touched a lot of lives, and I thought maybe this would be my own little way I could honor him. So cheers, Mr. Davis. Wherever you are, you are missed, sir. So without further ado, off we go to Super Mario Brothers 3. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen. So, one of the all-time greats right here, Super Mario Bros. 3. This was Ryan's favorite game, and, well, it's probably a lot of other people's favorite game, too. It's definitely way up there for me. So, first thing you're going to notice here, I mean, forgive me, I'm going to be doing this video. I mean, even if you're someone who just started playing video games, you probably know what Mario is and a little bit of the history behind him, but... I'm going to be, this is a special episode, so I'm going to be playing this assuming that you probably know a little bit about the Mario series already. So, Mario 3. Many consider this to be the best one because, well, it is the first one that has, it's not an open world. It, you can't really call it that, but it, it does have that sort of over map that we saw at the beginning there. Oh yeah, plus this, but we'll get to that. It has that over map and in sections of the levels you actually do have the freedom to chart your own progression there's levels that you can skip there's levels that you can choose to do in different orders and there's you know there's benefits to ah get back here you give me that one up Aww. there's bit different be uh, there's different benefits to attacking the levels in different ways and this game actually gives you that freedom which was at the time pretty darn revolutionary is a pretty uh, pretty incredible thing, and that's what a lot of people love about it. That open world progression, plus just the incredibly good level design, and just the personality that this game oozes. Super Mario, the original Super Mario Brothers is, I mean, it is one of the most iconic games in history. There's really no doubt about that. It is, it arguably defined a genre, it is arguably what brought video games back, or at least console games, back into the mainstream after the 1980s crash. Opinion is a little bit divided on Super Mario Bros. 2. It went in a very, very radically different direction. Um, I don't care for it as much as a lot of other people do, but uh, a lot of people really, really like that. But it was very, very different than the original Super Mario Bros. This one kind of straddled the line between the two. It reintroduced a lot of the... It's funny, when I'm talking here, I don't remember uh, some of the secrets as well. It reintroduced a lot of the more standard platforming and power-ups and scoring systems and things like that of the original Super Mario Brothers, but also 
brought some of the charm and zaniness of uh, Super Mario Bros. 2 to the mix as well. For example, well, what we're seeing right here. This was the the most recognizable, iconic addition to the series, which is his raccoon suit. And this suit, well, <laughs> it's kind of funny because raccoons really can't do anything that <laughs> this suit allows Mario to do. But it allows him to, if you get your speed built up, so you see you have that little power meter on the bottom there. You didn't get to see me do it there, but we'll show you that. So if you get that little power meter charged up, which you do by, by high speed running, if you get it up long enough, he basically can take off into the air, which you can use to either... There we go. So you can do this to either avoid certain difficult obstacles, or in many cases, get to special secret areas of the level, which you kind of saw me do in level one there. And it also allows you to slow and control your descent when you're taking a large jump down, and obviously, you can swat people with your tail, though it's not, the, 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 the tail weapon is not particularly useful because it's, it's pretty short range. And that's sort of the, that's the biggest addition to this. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than that. And as you can see, we, uh, we've got a lot of the sort of iconic Mario enemies in here. You got your Goombas, you got your... Oh, jeez. You got your Goombas, you got your Turtles. Now, here's the other major thing. So one of the other mechanics is that after... At the end of every level, there's that little sort of spinning... A card box and by getting three in a row of certain types of cards you would get different amounts of extra lives it was like one three and five up the thing that most Mario veterans know is that the pattern of that thing is always the same so if you hit it at the same way every time it's very very easy to get three stars which gives you five one-ups <laughs> as you can see I pulled it off there it's actually pretty easy to do so here's another thing. This allows you to... Coming into one of these houses, Toad allows you to just pick a box to pick up a power-up. And this is another mechanic that if you've played a lot of the newer Super Mario Brothers games, like literally in the new Super Mario Brothers series, which are modeled off of this in a lot of ways, you'll see stuff like this. And these are power-ups that you are allowed to collect and store. And you can trigger them before you go into a level. This becomes very, very helpful in later levels. Oh yes, in addition to that, this game also has scrolling, auto-scrolling levels. Which I actually didn't mind too much, I think they were pretty challenging. A lot of people really, really, really hate automatic scrolling levels. I don't mind them when they're done well, and I think most of these ones were. Uh, but being able to store power-ups like that was very, very helpful for later levels. Um, because it could, uh, it could give you a, a distinct advantage to make things a little easier when you're trying to deal with some of the, the harder levels. And there are people who play this game, even people who don't do the crazy amazing things like speedruns and that, who play this game, who make it look really easy. But for your first time out, some of the end levels in this game were pretty devilish. And being able to store power-ups like that was, was very, very useful. Uh, in the newer Super Mario Brothers games, it, they actually took the mechanic a step further, allowing you to bank power-ups within... And it's just catapulting you through to the end. Oh, jeez! I missed it there. They would allow you to um, store power-ups and actually recall them in the middle of a level, if you wanted to. You could also see I did that level there, but I'm going to do all the the, the uh, levels in uh, World 1 here for you. I could have skipped that, but... And here's another little mini-game. This graphic here, back when this game came out, was really impressive. So this is a little slot thing. You could time this as well. This I'm going to screw up. I don't, I'm not good with this anymore. I don't... The, you can time this... Oh, maybe I can pull it off. Can I do it? Da! Ah, close. The timing of that is static too, and it's pretty uh, easy to do once you've, you've figured it out. Oh, the soundtrack to this game was so good too. Nintendo were not always the best at maximizing the sound hardware in the NES. 
There were a lot of Capcom and Konami games that did some frankly voodoo things with that sound chip. But the Nintendo soundtracks, while not always being the most technically amazing, were always very memorable. And this is no exception. The Mario 3 soundtrack is just, uh, it's lovely. Just gives you the... The songs are relatively simple, but they are all very, very memorable. They're just giving you... Here we go. And you have some of the standard. And so here's the mid-level boss. These guys are all pretty easy. You just gotta hit him three times, avoiding his spikes. They get a little tougher in later levels, but that's also just the midpoint boss, too, so... And as you can see here, the game does have a scoring system. Oddly enough, they took out the recognition of high scores in this one compared to Mario One, uh, Super Mario Bros. 1, which I, again, I still don't understand it. But it has the scoring system. You can get a ridiculous number of lives, as you can see, and as usual, 100 coins. So this is another little mini game that pops up. This is just a memory game. I managed to finish this. This is not as predictable as the other ones, but I actually did manage to finish uh, this a few times, like clear everything out. So there, and you get one of these items for everything you match, you get the, the item in your inventory. So all I got out of that was that invulnerability star. So if you use that, you'll start the level invulnerable, but it's not permanent, obviously, because the invuln you know, the, uh, the star never is. Whee! And like here, this is a great, like, little funky, like, almost drum and bass-like remix of the Underworld theme from the original Super Mario Brothers, which is just quite possibly the most memorable song in video games. There's another little secret. Bounce you up to the clouds. And I tell you what, I mean, th there's a reason this game is so many people's favorite game of all time. It is just, it plays super, super well. Uh, the physics in this are, are uh, the controls in this are much tighter than in the original Super Mario Brothers. In that game, that game played well, don't get me wrong, but the movement and such was, whoops, bugger. Oh, jeez. Well, I screwed that up, didn't I? The movement in Super Mario Brothers, the original one, was uh, quite a bit floatier. You didn't have as much precise control over your character uh, in mid-jump and things like that. And in Super Mario Brothers 2, they went a little further with it where, it, well, that game obviously had multiple characters, each of which had their own jumping, you know, jumping control model, which was actually pretty cool and pretty inventive. But again, it was, it was, it was a little tricky. Whereas in this game, um, they had, it, it, they went back to a, obviously a single character and a single uh, physics design and control design. It plays a lot more like the original Super Mario Brothers, but it is much, much tighter. Uh, not that you couldn't adapt to the method in the old Super Mario Brothers, but in this game, it's much easier to know uh, what Mario's gonna do, and especially if you wanna control him, I mean, he can jump higher, and if you wanna control him in midair, much, much easier to do. Uh, which I appreciate. It's just, it's much, much tighter. The levels are obviously a lot more interesting. This was... This was 1988, so Nintendo had started to figure out their their own hardware a little bit, and it figured out how to, how to do... So, you always get one up for completing the three cards, even if they don't match. So, and here you go as well. There are some overworld enemies that move around. If you're lucky, you can avoid them. But if not... It's just like a little mini, a little mini encounter, basically. So just like this, and if you take him out, you get yourself a little present. Very simple, but a, a little thing that mixes stuff up a little bit. And we'll get another box here. So obviously, aesthetically, like what blew people's minds at the time was just how technically impressive this game was compared to Super Mario Brothers, which was only three years prior. Nintendo, by this point, had really started to to figure out their own hardware. Yeah, dog kind of looks like mine a little bit if he was eight bit. This is the case in every world. The king has been changed into something. We have to get the magic wand back. 
So we gotta hitch a ride on the Doom ship like a boss. Oh uh, yeah. So in the sum of these were ultimately the most challenging levels. And this was obviously a big twist on the uh, boss levels of the original Super Mario Brothers, is those were all castles. Uh, this is obviously on a ship. They're all auto-scrolling levels. That, and it's not just auto-scrolling left to right, it's left to right and up and down and all kinds of crazy stuff. And there's a much more varied amount of enemies and challenge types in here, which I really, really dig. And all of this is what people really liked. This game was... Well, the, the first glimpse most people got of this was in that god-awful Nintendo-sponsored movie, The Wizard. Uh, if anybody remembers that, I kind of wish I didn't. It was a pretty friggin' terrible movie. So... But it was a movie that was... It was supposed to be... Oh, jeez. It was supposed to be, a, uh, You know, this... Get back here, you. So now the Doom ship's moved, so I gotta go get it. If I hadn't completed all these levels, um, I might have had to complete one in order to get to it, depending on the world I was in. But because I cleaned the whole place out, we got nothing to worry about. Uh, yeah, The Wizard was supposed to be like this drama comedy thing. It was a friggin' terrible movie that basically Nintendo sponsored. But the big deal about it, and the reason a lot of people actually went to see it, was because it was where Super Mario Bros. 3 was unveiled to the world for the first time. You know, this was before we had E3 or Nintendo Direct, you know? So, and at the time, I just remember, I, I didn't, I thankfully was not crazy enough to go and see The Wizard in a the theater, although I did rent it and watch it on VHS. And this game, when it was shown there, just blew people's minds it, what Nintendo had, had done with the Mario series and how far they'd come in only three years. In terms of how the game played, level design, graphically, sound-wise, uh, just the level of imagination and inventiveness had just had just been turned up to 11. And they've had their ups and downs with Mario over the years, but I would say in a lot of ways they've really continued that tradition going forward. But this, this was the most memorable on the NES, which is a system that, you know, most people of my generation grew up with, at least, in, you know, in North America. It was, it was the, not the only console to be sure, but certainly one of the most recognizable ones. Always got to catch it in the air like that, because he looks like a total badass. And the ship disappears, because why not? I'm here to save the day! There we are. And of course, wouldn't be a Mario game with a rescuing Peach in it. Or sorry, Toadstool, not Peach. I apologize, Peach came later. And here we are. This was the other cool thing. Now, the original Super Mario Brothers did this too, but not to the degree that this did, and this is what was so impressive. Every world was its own theme. So this is obviously the desert world, there is an ice world, there is a water world, and you've seen this stuff before in a lot of uh, Mario games, but at the time, again, that was really, really amazing. The very, the, the you know, the amount of varied environments that Nintendo did just kind of stunned everybody. And, yeah, I hate those fire things. The variants that they had in this just kind of, just kind of blew everybody's mind. And it was a really inventive thing at the time, especially since each world came with new enemies, like these guys and those blocks that jump at you and all that other stuff. It wasn't just a, you know, it wasn't just a palette swap on the background. It was a whole varied amount of new stuff in every place. So you were really getting, in some ways, a whole new game every time you progressed to a different level. And it was really kind of stunning at the time. All right, let's see if I can pull this off this time. Come on, seven. Dang it! Fa! Screw you. Basically the opposite of what I did last time. Meh. So, 
it, it, and the, the thing that's great about this game is it still holds up incredibly well to this day. And it's one of those games that ever... Get out of there. There we go. It's one of those games that everybody remembers. Even people who didn't grow up with this or didn't... Or just don't play games very much. Like, my my ex-girlfriend, who is not really a gamer at all, is a huge, was a huge fan of this game. My current girlfriend, who was born the year this came out, is a huge fan of this game. Like, it's just, it, it's timeless, really. It's a game that everybody, if they haven't played, definitely knows, at the very least. You can tell them about it, and they'll be like, oh yeah, I know, I know Super Mario Bros. 3. And this game has had different iterations. Arguably, my favorite version of this, actually, is the version that came out in uh, the really interesting Super Mario All-Stars package for the Super Nintendo, which is something I will talk about someday. Unfortunately, you can't get that version anyway but on an original cartridge, but what the Nintendo did is they actually took Super Mario Bros. 1, 2, 3, the, uh, the Lost Levels, which was actually Super Mario Bros. 2 in Japan, which is basically just a new level set for, the, for Super Mario Bros. 1, except insanely difficult. Um, and some versions of, of that set also had other games in them, and they gave them all the 16-bit treatment. They basically took all the games, pretty much maintained all of their gameplay design and mechanics. They didn't change the levels, they didn't change anything else, they just up they just updated the graphics and the sound, and they did a really stellar job with it. And I actually think that's the best version of this, but, uh, the, you know, the original's still, still really, really excellent in its own right, needless to say. I think I actually could have gone beyond there. I think I missed a secret, but that's okay. And this is just a game that, that yeah, everybody knows. And really... It's one of those games that I'll pretentiously say is key for gaming literacy. If you're someone who really wants to learn about the history of video games and about the most iconic, important games that have ever existed in our time, this absolutely has to be high up on your list. There we go. Uh, nope. This has just got to be high up there. It's it's one of the greatest games of all time. It is a masterstroke. Oh yeah, this is like a... Yeah, just a little shortcut thing. And it doesn't really matter, because I've already been over there, but... Th this game is a masterstroke of history. It is one of the... It, it is exquisitely designed. It was a very impressive technical feat in its day, and this, many people already thought Nintendo some of the, the grand masters of game design, but this is what really cemented them as the gods of gaming in many ways. Nintendo is in a weird place right now, they're certainly not riding the high point that they used to, but I still think... If you put if you put a gun to my head and said, you know, name one name one company that makes that that has made the best video games, I don't think any try that again. I don't think anybody can objectively say with a straight face anybody other than Nintendo. They are they are the very best. And this is among their very best. And it's it's just an exquisitely designed piece of art, if you ask me. And it is something that everybody, everybody should play. And it's, uh... Like I said, it's no small wonder that... Someone with the love and knowledge of video games that Ryan Davis had would choose this as his favorite game. It's it's up there with mine, and it's probably the favorite game of a lot of different people. And it's not something you just say... You know, a lot of people will just say an old game is their favorite because it's what they remember. You know, nostalgia is a very, very powerful thing. I mean, nostalgia is part of the reason I started this series to begin with, but... The love for this game is not just nostalgic, it's just because it's that good, and 
games come and games go. Good games come. Great games come and great games go. But there are a few that you can really consider timeless and one that will still be con that will still be amazing and wonderful and a jewel to behold no matter how far in the future you go and this is one of those i think there's no doubt about that and i think it's a f maybe i don't know if this is a fitting tribute to Ryan Davis but you know, in my own little way with my dumb little YouTube channel. I hope this is something he would have liked. And, uh, I hope he would have liked to see somebody talking about his favorite game and remembering it as fondly as he does. But, uh, wherever he is, I hope... I hope he gets to play this an awful lot. Because <laughs> if I had to spend the rest of eternity playing only one game, you could do a lot worse than this one, that's for sure. So, yeah, that is Super Mario Bros. 3, published and developed by Nintendo in 1988 for the Nintendo Entertainment System. It's pretty easy to get your hands on this if you want to play it for yourself. As I said, the Super Mario All-Stars compilation is actually hard to find unless you get it on a cartridge. But Super Mario Bros. 3 has been released in various cartridge forms. I believe there's an edition of it, maybe on the Game Boy Advance, I'm not sure. But you can get it digitally uh, on the Wii Virtual Console, the Wii U Virtual Console, I believe on the 3DS Virtual Console. Uh, you can get this just about anywhere you can think of. And uh, if you haven't played this, you owe it to yourself to do so. And if you have played it, maybe this is a good time to play it again, especially if you are thinking of the great and amazing Ryan Davis today, as, uh, as I am and as many others are, I think. But I hope, uh, hope you found this interesting, um, and, uh, I hope Ryan would have found it interesting too, but I think it's fitting that one legend of video games be given a little tribute by another legend of video games. My name is Parallax Abstraction. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Because the ghost fish floated high above the ground